morning, everyone. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, everyone. Hello, everyone. Good morning. This is just to remind everyone. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Just to remind everybody that um, we have coffee, so please make sure that you have refreshments. Um, we will begin very, very shortly. We're still just trying to figure out the slide deck of our speaker for today. So please make sure that um, you are settled and comfortable where you are, and we will begin shortly. And general, you didn't see any. We met. So far. We will be this week. We have the British connection. I usually don't report to Washington. Yes, uh, and uh, I took the course at the University of Manchester. Good morning to our speakers and distinguished guests from the government, the diplomatic community, academia, and think tanks. My name is Charmaine Willoughby. I'm an associate professor of international studies at De La Salle University in Manila, and I'll be your host and moderator for this morning. On behalf of the Stratbase ADR Institute, the Embassy of Japan, and the Embassy of the United States in the Philippines, I welcome you all to this forum entitled Strengthening Partnerships Toward a Free and Open Indo-Pacific. Today, we will be joined by distinguished speakers who will share their thoughts on the Philippines' diplomatic ties with Japan and the United States. 
As background, in 2022, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida announced Japan's new national security strategy in response to the region's increasingly complex security challenges. Japan is set to strengthen its defense and security capabilities, including having counterstrike capabilities and increasing its defense budget as part of redirecting the country's foreign and security policy principles. The Philippines' strong alliance with the United States and partnership with Japan, a trilateral security cooperation among them is proposed in the form of joint military exercises and humanitarian assistance and disaster response cooperation. Speakers for today's event will discuss Japan's new security strategy, the economic relations of the Philippines and Japan, and the possibility of a Philippines-US-Japan security cooperation. To open today's discussion, let us welcome Mr. Kenichi Matsuda, Deputy Chief of Mission of the Embassy of Japan in the Philippines, for his opening remarks. Thank you very much. Distinguished guests and speakers, ladies and gentlemen, magandang baga po sa inyong lahat. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this hybrid town hall discussions titled Strengthening Partnership Towards a Free and Open in the Pacific. It is my privilege to introduce Professor Miyake Kunihiko who used to be a Japanese career diplomat and is very influential expert internationally, particularly in the field of security. Professor Miyake's expertise in foreign affairs and national security will surely give us uh, some important good for thought regarding our regional situation. Also, joining him is Dr. Ronald U. Mendoza, who, who will de deliver a lecture on sustaining Japan-Philippines economic relations. Professor Gregory B. Pauling will also join us virtually for his lecture on uh, fostering a Philippine-US-Japan security cooperation. And the severe and challenging security environment we have been facing, Japan has uh, announced a new national security strategy and related guidelines last December. In the connection of these documents, President Marcos, who visited Japan last month, he welcomed Japan's commitment on the maintaining and developing, developing a free and open international order based on rule of law. So I look forward to listening to Professor Miyake's view on this point in today's lecture. As the very foundation of the international order is being shaken, so now the importance of free and open international order based on the rule of law is increasing. Today's theme is the, our partnership towards a free and open in the Pacific or FOIP. The basic idea of FOIP is to ensure the, the peace and prosperity in the in the Pacific region and beyond through the establishing a free and open order based on the shared values and principles. In promoting the FOIP, Japan has attached importance to cooperation with ASEAN, and particularly the Philippines is a crucial partner for Japan, considering that we share the common values such as freedom, democracy, respect for basic human rights, and of law. It is also it is also vital 
to uphold the rule of law on tackling issues surrounding the South China Sea. Japan shares with the Philippines the importance of the relevant international law, particularly the United Nations Convention of the, on the Law of the Sea and the 2016 Arbitration Award. In addition, Japan attaches importance to strengthening the maritime law enforcement capabilities of the Philippines and has been working on the, the human resource development for Philippine Coast Guard for many years. In recent years, we have been working in this field in close cooperation with U.S. Coast Guard. And we believe that it is very, very important to build up such practical cooperation among Japan, U.S., and the Philippines. Lastly, we'd like to express my deepest gratitude to our friends and partners from the Stratobase ADR Institution and U.S. Embassy of Manila for having this hybrid town hall discussions possible. Thank you very much, and we hope that this discussion will provide a platform for experts and scholars for sharing their assessments and their recommendations on the way forward toward a free and open in the Pacific. Marami salamat po at mabuhay kayo lahat. Thank you, Mr. Matsuda. Um, now, it is my honor to introduce our uh, one of our speakers for today. Uh, Professor Miyake Kuniko is the research director of the Canon Institute for Global Studies, a Japan-based private think tank established by Canon Inc. in 2008. He's a visiting professor at Ritsumeikan University and the president of the AOI Foreign Policy Institute, a private think tank based in Tokyo, Japan. Professor Miyake is an expert on foreign affairs and national security. He wrote papers centered on security and international policies for the resolution of emerging social issues, enhancing dissemination of Japan's views and information to other countries and international networking. Um, he's also done some work on the assessment and analysis of long-term strategic trends in East Asia studies in policy simulation. For today's forum, Professor Miyake will discuss the geopolitics of Japan and her grand strategy, current international situation, and Japan's policy on national security. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Miyake Kunihiko. Good morning, Kuni Miyake. Nice to be back to Manila. I've been, it's been a while since I, I came here last time, but um, it's a great honor to be invited to uh, this great occasion to talk about what, what I am to, supposed to talk about, uh, the grand strategy or whatever they call. Well, our DCM, uh, Mr. Matsuda, beautifully summarized what uh, uh, we are supposed to say. So I don't need to add anything. And I don't want to talk about propaganda of the Japanese government, okay? I'm not the part of the Japanese government anymore. I am a free citizen with the freedom of speech. I'm not a journalist. I'm not a diplomat. I'm not a government official. I'm not a speech uh, uh, maker. But what I'm doing is thinking. I try to think all the time. So I'd like to share with you, no propaganda today, and I got on, only 30 minutes. I want to show you um, how I see, not Japan's take, but it's my take on how to strengthen the partnership. Okay? So I, I hope you can see it. Maybe where's the best place to hide myself? Um, this is my, my favorite picture. See, uh, there, any, anybody from the U.S. Embassy today? Thank you. Thank you. I, I forgot his name, but uh, 
uh, is a great, great president of yours. And this is uh, the German chancellor, and they are yelling at each other. And in the middle of that, the Mr. Abe, the late Mr. Abe was wondering what to do. This is a, a snapshot of the uh, G7 summit in Canada several years ago. After that, oops, did you get it? Well, it's slow, but it's okay. The uh, new president was elected, and this is a uh, U.S.-Russia summit, um, December 2021. And I know this gentleman had a war plan already at that time to invade Ukraine, and he did. And there were some opposition uh, protests, but it didn't work. Then in Tokyo, this is a quad meeting, summit meeting, historical, for the first time, spring 2022. Then there's another historical moment. The Japanese prime minister was invited to the NATO summit later on. And then what happened? Ms. Pelosi uh, visited Taiwan, then followed by the party congress in China, and the balloon was shut down, and very, very memorable moment. Your president visited Key. So how do you interpret this? This is the question. So first of all, I'd like to uh, ask the U people in the US embassy to give me the permission to use the uh, Star Wars posters. It's indispensable when I try to explain how I see the world. The first Star Wars movie, a poster, is called The Force Awakens. It is not The Force Awakens. It is the dark side. Awakens. You see, dark size means ugly, unhealthy, kind of nationalistic, populistic, discriminatory sort of a sentiment. It was there in the United States, there in Europe, even in my country, and elsewhere. So they, the, the problem is that the dark side is coming back. Number two, the empire strikes back, but it's not the empire strikes back. The empires strike back. The empires, those empires representing the dark side, are coming back. I don't want to name those nations, but uh, I can name Russia. I can name maybe Persia, Iran. I can name well, I don't. I don't want to name, but you know, the other one. The third. movie is episode one. By the way, to the best of my knowledge, Star Wars uh, movies have at least nine episodes, plus additional several others. But episode one says the Phantom Menace. It's not Phantom Menace. It is the nuclear menace. I don't have to worry, I talk about it, because our, our neighbor is developing another, and some other uh, neighbors have already. So, what does it mean? In, the, in, in a nutshell, this is the return of the Jedi. Okay, but it's not the Jedi who returned. What returned is the nationalism. Whoops. Return of the nationalism. Return of nationalism is my theme. And in order to cope with that, do we really have a strategy? Yes, we do. That's quite. But having said that, I'd like to show you, uh, this is a typical uh, map of the, uh, to, to, uh, indicating the flow of goods and services, maybe uh, money as well, and human resources around Japan. But this is what the economists uh, wish to use, but I'm not going to use this map. I'd rather use this map. 
Japan is an island nation. And the Philippines is also an island nation. That's fine. The problem is the distance between the continent and the island nation. What if the Philippines were Taiwan? Take a look. Something like this. If you were located that close, you feel more potential threat. And then my assumption is, what if you were continental? What if you were part of the continent? Something like this. You could be speaking Chinese by now. So this is geopolitics, in my view. So see what's going to happen. For you, well, people say, well, thank you, Mr. Abe. You invented this, and even the Americans stole it. That's not the case. That's not the case. Hoi was just rediscovered. I was in uh, Kuala Lumpur. Oh, still, I always get things upside down, but it's a, it's a mirror image, but the Muslims came to uh, Malacca in the, I think, the 14th, 15th century or so. And, oh, before that. Then they started preaching Islam all over the East China Sea and South China Sea. Then, next map is, is, is a Chinese maritime, well, not expansion, uh, ex, uh, uh, execu not execution, what do you call it? It's a kind of maritime mission uh, led by uh, Admiral Zhonghe. Zhonghe is uh, Chinese, but the, his, he was a Muslim. So he started from here all the way to, through the uh, South China Sea and went to the Indian Ocean. This is the second challenge for the Indo-Pacific region. Then, almost not simultaneously, slightly later, this was the age of discovery, great discovery. The Brits just sailed all the way to the South China Sea and this is another example of free and open in the Pacific. But finally, what we have now is the PECOM. You don't call it PECOM uh, anymore, but it used to be PECOM. U.S. Pacific Command covered most of the Indian Ocean from the beginning. And before 19, I guess, 1980s, there was, no, there was no U.S. CENTCOM. Central Command was created in the 1980s, I guess, because I was posted in Baghdad. I was an Arabic language officer. I know nothing about, uh, about Southeast Asia. I only know about the Middle East. So CENTCOM was new. So before CENT the CENTCOM was created, PACOM covered all the Indian Ocean. So PACOM was originally, from the beginning, Indo-PACOM. So that's the history of FOIP, and that's the history of uh, rediscovery of FOIP. So Mr. Abe just rediscovered it. And we are getting back. But the, as you have seen, it's so interesting to know that maritime powers, basically maritime powers, try to secure the free and open in the Pacific. The Brits the Arabs, Americans, but for the first time, probably in the history of Indo-Pacific region, a land power is trying to dominate the Indo-Pacific region for the first time. Well, Chongfu did, the Ming Dynasty did, tried, but at that time, it was short-lived. And it's still, uh, they are a, were a land power, and they are a land power, but they want to become a sea power, probably for the first time in the history of that uh, great nation of 1.4 billion people. So let's move on. 
we have a war in Ukraine, unfortunately, and I'm sure that it will continue, unfortunately. There are many reasons for that. I will get to that later. But Tokyo learned five lessons from the war in Ukraine. And the first lesson is the most important. So I start with the second lesson. Second lesson is very simple. No defense without armed forces. Okay? It, is, it may sound odd, but it is extremely important in Tokyo because many people used to believe that without armed forces, we have no war. Ah. Anyway, that's number one. Number two, no victory without winning an info war, information warfare. This is extremely important. The Americans have sacrificed a lot, potentially. Risks critical human uh, information by declassifying very many pieces of uh, sensitive information. So that was good. Outsmarted the Russians. That's fine. Let's check the third lesson. Lesson number four. No defense without military alliance. Remember, Ukraine had no ally. They were not part of the NATO. They couldn't join the NATO. So, okay, it's fine. Jap as far as Japan is concerned, it's great because we have an alliance with the United States. And I say, ah, 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 ah. Ah, ah, ah. Why? Because if you don't bleed, if you don't fight for your territory, no ally will help you. Okay? Why I say this? It's very simple. The year 2021, August 15, remember, it was the fall of Kabul. And remember, the Kabul airport, all the um, Afghanis went to the airport to, to leave the country in vain. You know what happened to the um, uh, Republic of Afghanistan, or whatever they called? The president fled the country. President Ghani fled the country while President Zelensky stayed. That's why we helped them. Okay? So this is, these are lessons, four lessons I learned, but the most important lesson is this. Sorry, it's slow. You cannot trust experts on Russia. Okay, they make mistakes. You see, many Russia hands in Tokyo you know, before the 24th of February last year, say, ah, 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 the Russians, not gonna, Putin will never invade Ukraine. They were all wrong. Why? Because they were stupid? No, they are serious people. Very, very uh, good scholars. Why they make such a big mistake? Because Putin is a human. Human beings make mistakes. To err is human, to forgive divine. This is the most important lesson we learned because such a dictator in that part of the world and such a brilliant guy, smart guy, made a mistake, huge strategic mistake. So why not similar dictators in our neighborhood? I don't want to name those gentlemen, but um, they could make mistakes. That's, what, that's the lesson we must learn, because dictators make mistakes. And absolute dictators make more mistakes, because they have less accurate information. And the mistakes made by the ab absolute dictators cannot be easily corrected. Look at the zero COVID thing. So this, this is the lesson. OK, shall we go? Um, today, I don't have enough time. So I like to talk about that country, uh, history of uh, about 2,100 years, 2,021 centuries in 21 seconds. Okay, <laughs> the time is like life is very short, so we have. This is not uh, Red China. This is uh, Han Chinese. I don't want to name Han Hans. And uh, in the world of uh, geopolitics, if you have a one nation then usually that nation is surrounded by four barbarians in the north, in the south, in the east, and the west. 
So this is the Northern Barbarian, and this is the Eastern Barbarian, like us. Then you have many. So let's uh, move the map. 21 seconds only. So how the Han Chinese expand and shrink. Okay, this is the second century BC. Can you see it? Second century AD, fifth century, and then uh, Tang Dynasty got uh, then got smaller and got much smaller, and Qin Dynasty came and the Mongolians took over. Then the Ming Dynasty resurrected, but then got smaller. Then Qin Dynasty came, Russians came down, Japanese came in, and then it is China. Uh, did you get it? Did you? Oh, I I don't think you did. Let's make it a little bit slower. And you see four barbarians, but the second century BC, second century AD, and even the fifth century, the barbarians are coming from the north. That's why they built the Great Walls. Okay? But after that, Tang Dynasty uh, was, was there. So everything uh, seems to be okay. But that's uh, uh, not going to happen because in the, in the middle of the 8th century, they got smaller. And this map, this is my favorite map. This is the homeland of Han Chinese, and this is the Central Asia. Then you got a corridor here. And the corridor is sandwiched by the Uyghurs and Tibetans. This is the typical strategic or geopolitical vulnerability of the Han Chinese. And then, in the 11th century Song Dynasty, Han Chinese got smaller because neighboring barbarians are much more powerful. You have Uyghurs, Tibetans, everywhere. Then, the 13th, 12th century, this is Qin Dynasty. Qin is the Manchurian. So the Han Chinese got smaller. Then, Mongolians took over most of the uh, Eur Eurasian continent, but it didn't last long. Then Ming Dynasty has resurrected. Then came back the Tibetans, Tatalis, Uyghurs, everybody's back. The second half of the Ming Dynasty, this is, this is another Manchurian dynasty, the birth of Manchurian dynasty. They are the Qin Dynasty. So Qin Dynasty took over. Then the Russians wanted that Vladivostok port because it's unfrozen. Then we gave in. Then you have People's Republic. So what do you learn from this? To make the long, 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 long story short, all the land borders of the People's Republic is safe. Secure. Russians are not their enemies anymore. Not friends, maybe, but not enemies, at least for a while. Then they got Manchuria, they got Inner Mongolia, they have uh, Tibet, uh, Tibetan uh, district, and they have Uyghur area. So, who are the uh, barbarians in the south? Indians? I don't think so. Indians not going to go across the high mountains. And they have a buffer, buffer zone in, 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 in Tibet. So maybe Vietnamese. But the last war between China and Vietnam was 1979. So since then, there's maybe some fist fights in the high in the mountains between the Indian and Chinese border. But the land borders are safe. So if the land borders are safe, why do they need such a huge armed forces? Why do they need? Aircraft carriers. Why do they need so many accurate uh, precision guided missiles? Very simple. The threat comes not from land, but the threat comes from the sea. Why threat comes from the sea? Because the most prosperous and most vulnerable part of that country is located on the coast of the Pacific Ocean. And cheap labor cost, 
They became a factory of the world, as we did, as we were, and import the cheapest materials and raw materials and add values, then we export, export it to with mo most expensive uh, uh, prices. This is what we did. What do you need to do that? It's three lines of communication. Without three lines of communication, you cannot do that. And China is doing that. And unfortunately, the threat comes from the sea and comes from Japan-US Security Treaty Alliance. I think that's what they have in mind. That's my interpretation. I may be wrong. Let's move on. Today, I like to talk about history. I'm not a historian, but I like to talk about history. I, I'm not interested in propaganda, but the way I see the world, you have to have a historical perspective. So I give you three maxims about history for the 2020s. Number one, the fool learns from experience, while the wise learn from history. I'm sure everybody's wise. Then you know how to learn from history. Well, life is too short. So that's the number one maxim. Second maxim is some people say said by Mark Twain that I don't know. History doesn't repeat itself, but sometimes it often rhymes. This is my favorite uh, take. Huh? What do you mean? There's, the history will not be completely reproduced or repeated, but sometimes something similar happens. So I like to compare the history of the 1930s with the current 2020s. The reason why, I, take, I tell you the reason why later. Number three, in times of contingencies, by the way, this maxim is made, made up by, by myself. So don't, 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 don't write it down, please. In times of contingencies, political leaders adopt strategic rationale, not the economic rationale. So strategic judgment is much more difficult. That's why leaders make mistakes. And that's why dictators make more mistakes. And absolute dictators make the worst mistakes. So in a nutshell, what do we learn from the comparison between the 1930s and 2020s? This is my theme today. History rhymes. I'm talking about Japan in the 1930s. You know, the World War I made Japan very rich, and they became a um, uh, first-class nation, I don't know so proud of themselves, so arrogant as well. And the economic boom didn't last. And what happened is that Black Thursday and Japanese rural area was devastated. But then started the um, uh, economic uh, problem. But World War I for Japan is probably the war on terror for that huge nation. Why? War on terror gave them a great golden opportunity. If you remember 2001, I vividly remember, uh, President Bush was about to change, at least modify, the policy vis-a-vis -vis China, because it was already a problem. And then 9-11 took place. So I was in the North America Bureau, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I was in China already. So I thought that the smart people in Beijing might have told the Americans like this, ah, oh, you were attacked by the uh, terrorists in the Middle East. Okay, go ahead, go ahead and kill them. Oh, by the way, we have another kind of terrorists in my country. They're called Uyghurs. Okay, so why do you take care of the terrorists in the Middle East we will take care of the terrorists in Xinjiang. Then they made a deal. No harsh 
policy change of vis-a-vis -vis China, well, vis-a-vis -vis that great country, and the economy prospered. Okay, so let's move on. The problem is the 1931 Manchurian incident. We created a puppet state. That was a strategic mistake, of course, but I don't want to go into details because I have no time. The problem is when we created that stupid the, uh, the, the um, puppet state, the League of Nations sent a fact-finding mission led by Lord Lytton. It was called Lytton Report. And just criticizing, denouncing Japanese behavior. So we were so furious, then we left, walked out from the floor of the League of Nations in 1932. So what about the Manchuria incident is the beginning of our international isolation. So what about that great country in our, in our neighborhood? It was artificial islands in the South China Sea. Remember, that is the beginning of their international isolation. And instead of Litton report in 1931, International Court of Arbitration, Permanent Court of Arbitration, uh, made a judgment that nine dash line, uh, 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 uh. This is a Litton report in the 21st century, in my view. I may be wrong. Then, the Chinese, I should say, the great countries. Isolation started. I don't know what's going to happen to ne next, but in the 30s and 40s, what happened is that we have tripartite alliance pact, German, Italian, and Japanese, which led to, to, to hell. But don't we have something similar? Russian, Chinese, Iranian, not pact, but coordination. Russians are using Iranian drones to kill Ukrainians in Europe. So I, I don't know whether the, the great country will uh, supply uh, lethal weapons to the Russians. I don't know. But I'm a little bit worried about it. Then I'm not saying that history repeats. And I'm, uh, there are so many similarities as well as differences. So I, I stop here, but one thing I like to tell you is that, as I told you before, politicians make mistakes. And in the 1930s and 2020s, the same. They tend to make mistakes out of intuition or coincidence or just simple misjudgment. They make mistakes. And um, we entering a new era when the politicians start making those stupid strategic mistakes. If we were, we should be worried. I hope I, I'm wrong. Accumulation of those stupid mistakes create a new normal. Then in the era of new normal, they continue making mistakes. See what's going to happen. Well, I'm not talking about mistakes, but um, in as far as the South China Sea is concerned, or East Asia in general is concerned, there are some mistakes as well. There are, in my view, four examples of power vacuum created in our part of the world. The first one is this gentleman, your Secretary of State, Dean Atchison, 1950, before I was born. He said, this defensive parameter runs along the Lucians, blah, 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 blah. What, it, what he meant is very simple. This is the defense line of the United States in 1950. And this is very prob problematic because the Korean Peninsula was not included and Taiwan was not included. That's why Kim Jong-un's grandfather invaded. This is the first power vacuum I witnessed. And then um, I was about to, to, to not to use it, but I decided to use this. This is the fourth power vacuum in our neighborhood. Second 
is the withdrawal of the U.S. forces from Vietnam. And um, unfortunately, uh, some, some shores and islands were taken over. Then Russians left the, um, the bay uh, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in Vietnam. So that was the third vacuum. But the fourth vacuum, the most recent one, is decisive, very unfortunate. I was deputy director at the SOFA division in the Japanese Foreign Service. And I visited, I might have told you before, uh, Subic in 1988. And then, um, just before the Gulf War started in 1991, or after, oh, 1991, there are bases called Clark and Subic in the Philippines. At that time, whoops, waiting, April, 1991, to the best of my knowledge, I may be wrong, if I'm wrong, please correct me. Uh, Mount Pinatubo erupted, then devastated all the US bases in the Philippines. And at that time, I dare to say, you're not always friendly to the Americans. So b b wisely or unwisely, you kicked the Americans out of Subic and Clark and other bases. I was visiting Yokosuka almost uh, every week. And I asked the uh, US Naval uh, Admiral, are you sure that you're OK by leaving Subic? I, uh, I often ask, raise the same question. Is it OK to leave Subic? And the guy in the US Navy said, uh, 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 don't worry. We are OK. We have Yokosuka. We have Sasebo. So don't worry. But you should have worried. After the rejection of the renewal of the base uh, use uh, pact uh, agreement, three months later, February 1992, a neighboring great country enacted a new law called Territorial Waters Act, saying that all the nine dash line and the vicinity are their waters. Just three months after that, power vacuum was created, and then they took advantage of that. This is the fourth and latest power vacuum example in that part of the world. So we are trying to, we cannot undo it anymore, but we want to make this part of the world the important location for the Japanese and Chinese and Korean and everybody's sea lines of communication. Let's move on. OK, finally, I don't want to take up your time too long. I have to close. Um, I, I left the government in 2005. So it's almost 18 years. Alhamdulillah, I have no connection with the U Japanese government anymore. I don't have to represent the government. I don't have to do the propaganda. But I wanted to be a strategic thinker, if I may. In order to think strategically, I always at a loss what to do. But sometimes I have a magic of putting the map up, upside down. Turn it around 180 degrees. Not 360, but 180 degrees. The left side is a typical map of the United Kingdom. And this is the typical map of Japan. I hope you can see it. So when I try to think strategically, I go something like this. Did you get it? Did you get it? Did, do you know the similarity? You see, just imagine there is a small island nation, virtually no natural resources, lots of human resources, located not too far, but not too close from the continent, huge continent, where the monsters reside. What is the best way to maximize the national interest of such a small, tiny island nation? There are three conditions for that. 
Number one, balance of power on the continent. As I told you, there are monsters on the continent. What if one of them became powerful, stronger, dominant, and hegemon? Then that will come back to us. That will be your threat to the island nation in the neighborhood. The best way is not to divide, but prevent any hegemon from becoming dominant in, on the continent. That's number one, balance of power on the continent. Second condition is healthy. Healthy distance from continent. The British fought in France so many years, so many decades for nothing. We uh, invaded uh, or we landed in the Korean Peninsula in the seventh century for nothing. Hideyoshi Toyotomi invaded the Korean Peninsula somewhere in the 19th, uh, no, no, the 15th or 16th century, I don't remember, for nothing. We annexed the Korean Peninsula for nothing in the 20th century. Why? Because we are a maritime nation, and if you stay on the ground, on the continent too long, or intervention, too much intervention will kill you. That's the lesson, second lesson I learned from the island nation theory. Number three, the most important, is secure sea lines of communication. As I said, the island nation is full of human resources, but no natural resources. So you have to live on value-added free trade. You know that to do that, you need sea lines of communication. So this is, those three, it's not, not my invention. I learned it from the British history, British Empire. So I say this, layers of island partnership or island alliances. This is my conclusion. In the history of Japan, modern history, since the uh, 19th century, there are two important island alliances. Number one, it's a Anglo-Japanese alliance in the, in the uh, beginning of the 20, 20, 20th century. With the help from the British fleet, we could secure, we could keep the balance between the Russian Empire and the Chinese Empire. With the help from the British fleet, we could stay away from continental office. Although we are involved already, but we could stay away. And most importantly, with the help from the British fleet, we could secure sea lines of communication and we could prosper with free trade. And most importantly, we became democratic. That was the most important strategic decision we made in the modern history of Japan. But unfortunately, which country was the most jealous of the Anglo-Japanese alliance? The United States. So the United States tried to kill the UK-Japan alliance successfully. So we gave it up. And we started the naval uh, 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 disarmament uh, negotiations. And in addition to that, that was already a big mistake. But in addition to that, we made another huge mistake. That is switching from the maritime alliance to um, land alliance, what I call, with the, uh, such continental states like Germany or Italy. So we moved, switched to a new alliance, which is the biggest, most stupid, fatal strategic mistake. So that's why we lost everything. But fortunately, fortunately, in 1945, we started coming back to another Island Alliance, this time, Alliance with the United States. What? America, it's a continental state. No, 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 no. America is an island. It's a naval power. 
It's an island state with the help from, excuse me, with the help from the Seventh Fleet, we could maintain the balance between communist Soviet Union and communist China. We could maintain the balance between the North and the South and the Korean Peninsula. With the help from the Seventh Fleet, we could stay away from continental open. And most importantly, with the help from the Seventh Fleet, we could secure three lines of communication again. And that's why we could prosper with free trade. And most importantly, we regained democracy. This is not a coincidence to me. This is a natural consequence of it. But unfortunately, the problem is that our neighbor is so big. You see, if I am allowed to say that my assumption is that the great country of 1.4 billion people may be making a similar mistake, uh, uh, similar to what we have done in the 1930s. Maybe that magnitude is 10 times more than we did because their population is 10 times more. So if that's the case, is the US-Japan alliance alone enough? I don't think so. Then what do you need? I need, I proposed, and it's, it's coming true. I proposed 10 years ago. What about second or third, I would say, third island alliance for Japan? What's that? Well, the alliance with Australia. What? Australia is another maritime nation. It's the second biggest island on Earth. The biggest island nation on Earth is the United States. So with the Australians, we are developing a, a, a mechanism to keep the, uh, our part of the world more stable. But still, it's not enough. We need more islanders, more islanders like the Philippines, islanders like the United Kingdom, because we all share the values. We all share the notion that no attempt to change the status quo by force should be materialized. Well, time is up. I have to close. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Miyake, uh, for a very comprehensive and enlightening uh, presentation. Our next speaker for this morning is Dr. Ronald Mendoza, who is a committee member of the United Nations Committee of Experts on Public Administration. He's also a senior economist at the Ateneo Policy Center. From 2016 to 2022, he served as the Dean of the Ateneo School of Government. From 2011 to 2015, he was an Associate Professor of Economics at the Asian Institute of Management and the Executive Director of the AIM Rizalino S. Navarro Policy Center for Competitiveness. Prior to that, he was a senior economist with the United Nations in New York. His research background includes work with UNICEF, UNDP, the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, the Economist Intelligence Unit, and several Manila-based non-governmental organizations. Dr. Mendoza joins us today to share his views on sustaining Philippine-Japan economic relations. Sir Ron? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Willoughby, for that very generous introduction. Uh, Mr. Kenichi Matsuda, Professor uh, Konihiko Miyake, uh, Mr. Greg Poling, if he's here already, uh, Dr. Shamin Willoughby, Professor Dindo Manhit, Christina D, and our friends in ABRI, and of course our guests today from the National Security, Diplomatic Development, and Business Communities. Magandang umaga po. Good morning. Ohayo gozaimas. It's my pleasure to say, share some thoughts today on the growing importance of the Japanese-Philippines economic relationship 
And I must say this is um, a bit more bland than the presentation of our guest. <laughs> so I hope you will bear with me. I'll, I'll share some statistics and uh, later on my views on, on the relationship. But I wanted to thank the first presenter because I learned a lot uh, from that presentation. While my contribution is more focused on the economic angle, I will try to emphasize that the broader context goes well beyond the economic sphere, spanning national security, hence appropriately the broader theme for today's meeting. Let me begin by first stating some basic facts. Japan is one of the Philippines' top trading partners for at least over half a century now. Despite many challenges, the Philippines has come a long way from its more traditional export bundle to Japan some 20 years ago when I was in college. I managed to track down a 20-year-old study by PIDS, one of the things we were reading back then, which stated, Japan is the second largest market for Philippine agricultural exports. Japan imports close to 80% of our bananas, 98% of our pineapples, and 61% of our mangoes from the Philippines. This was in the uh, early 2000s. In fact, much has changed in the last two decades, thanks also to Japanese foreign investment. In the late 1990s alone, the share of traditional Philippine agricultural exports to total exports to Japan declined from about 28% in 1991 to only about 8% by 2000 in the span of a decade. Fast forward to the near present since we don't have much time and using late 2021 figures, some of the top exports of the Philippines to Japan, not bananas, not pineapples, not these traditionals. They were insulated wirings, integrated circuits, passenger and cargo ships, nickel mats. These were among the top exports. Some of the top imports of the Philippines from Japan were pretty much the same thing. Integrated circuits, office machine parts, steam turbines, printed circuit boards. There's a lot of input trade, which characterizes the value chains in this part of the world. I will speak a little bit about the national security character of those value chains later, and the implications of the tech war on those chains. As a personal anecdote, I had the privilege of visiting one of the semiconductor manufacturing facilities of the Japanese uh, investor Murata in one of our Batangas industrial parks. Very impressive uh, industrial park, managed by a good friend of mine, actually. A facility that manufactures hundreds of thousands of multi-layer ceramic capacitors for export every week. These are key components of all modern electronic devices, including these things, mobile phones and notebook computers. Just for your reference, in case you have not heard of a multi-layer ceramic capacitor, this thing, this mobile phone has 300 to 400 ceramic capacitors in it. The notebook computer in front of me has about 700 to 800 of these capacitors. They help make gadgets lighter, smaller, and manage heat better. And it is a key input on almost every electronic gadget in today's world. Morata employs about 1,600 mostly young Filipinos. All these suggest how important the trade and investment relationship with Japan is from the Philippines' perspective. Beyond being an export market, Japan has become a technology conduit for the Philippines, one which can actually dramatically improve further as the Philippines needs to play industrial and technological catch-up in the region. As regards development financing and aid in referring to 2020 figures, Cumulatively, Japan is the top provider of official development assistance to the Philippines, accounting for about 36% of total, with ADB and the World Bank following. Total assistance from the three development assistance partners in that year accounted for 86% of our ODA. In addition, increasingly, Japan has become one of our most steadfast security partners. The Philippines may be one of the first recipients of Japan's security cooperation grant for regional partners, and there is talk of an enhanced security arrangement across U.S., Japan, and the Philippines, a security triad that could better counter and respond to the rising geopolitical risks in the region. Maybe this is the Sea Alliance that uh, our guest was speaking about. I will not talk in length about the security partnership with Japan, 
But I will say, as an economist who appreciates the critical importance of national security, that sustained and inclusive economic development is one of the key ingredients of our sustained economic and defense partnership. Japanese investments and development assistance support in job creation, technology transfer, and rapid mod modernization and connectivity in the Philippines over the decades, all of these have been a force for inclusive development in the country. An additional key point, and despite our earlier checkered history, Japan has become one of our closest and trusted democratic partners in Asia. This goes well beyond the economic and security partnerships our two nations have forged. This is people to people. Perhaps unsurprisingly, nationwide polls of Filipinos' trust of other countries place Japan in or near the top, along with US, Canada, and Australia, with China placing at the bottom in recent years. This partnership is forged during uncertain times, and it's critical to acknowledge that the economic partnership is even more important in the face of presently elevated geopolitical risks, notably due to rising tensions involving China and the US. So I'm gonna speak a little bit about this backdrop. For context, in the earlier globalization period, and I'm not a historian either, but I like uh, economic history, so I'm going to uh, follow our colleagues' lead. U.S. trade and investment policies reflected a deep tolerance of China-U.S. Inter interdependence in the early years, and attempting to recalibrate it rather than take it down altogether. Things changed since around 2016-2017. In the face of renewed charges of currency manipulation, various retaliatory measures, including wide-ranging tariffs on Chinese imports were ramped up by the United States. One key difference from earlier spats between the two nations is that economic issues are now increasingly meshed with national security concerns. China's growing economic and technological ascendance is increasingly viewed as a national security threat by the United States. In December 2017, the congressionally mandated U.S. national security strategy talked about, open quote, a new era of strategic competition, close quote. Words like adversary, rival, and strategic competitor, these are now among the words used to describe the once close economic partner. Tit for tat uh, trade strategies on tariff escalation quickly gave way to stronger policy measures. In August 2022, which is just a few months back, the Biden administration passed the US Chips and Science Act, which promised to boost domestic semiconductor chip production in the United States, while also countering China's and Asia's dominance in this sector. The White House website noted how, open quote, America invented the semiconductor, but today produces about 10% of the world's supply and none of the most advanced chips. Instead, we rely on East Asia for 75% of global production. The Chips and Science Act will unlock hundreds of billions more in private sector semiconductor investment across the country, including production essential to national defense and critical sectors." Close quote. In addition, the US introduced sweeping export controls in October 2022, just a few months back, designed to stifle China's access to certain semiconductor chip and chip making equipment. Later in November 2022, the US Federal Com Communication Commission decided to ban the importation or sale of certain technology products from China that pose security risks to US critical infrastructure. And just weeks ago, the US, Japan, and the Netherlands joined forces to put more teeth into export restrictions on advanced chip making machinery to China. So this part of the history is only about three to four months old. These measures form part of what many now refer to as the tech war that signals a stronger attempt at decoupling between the US and China, potentially forging a broad array of economic actors, not just in these countries, but in other parts of the world to rethink and recalibrate their participation in international value chains that also involve China. Recent US policy measures are likely creating ripple effects beyond US companies, as investors from other countries expect they will be forced to choose between the US and China. This is a report from the Financial Times. 
Open quote, on Wednesday, the huge chip maker SK Hynix broke ranks among the South Korean companies and admitted publicly that despite the waivers in place for now, it might not always get away with the block straddling game. It and many other groups, particularly in South Korea and Japan, still hope to play. In a call with investors, the company's chief marketing officer said that it was making contingency plans for an extreme situation in which the restrictions enforced by Washington threatened the operation of Hynix's huge memory chip factory in China and obliged a reshoring back to Korea. On the Chinese side, the country's 14th five-year plan emphasized its dual circulation strategy. The plan envisions China remaining open to the world, this is what they call the great international circulation, while also developing its own domestic market, what they call the great domestic circulation. With economic modernization, the emancipated poor from the last four decades, numbering hundreds of millions of Chinese who are now middle class, now form part of that vibrant middle class in a large and growing domestic Chinese market. Continuing to build on these gains and strengthening the country's independence and resilience appears to be central to their new plan. If this decoupling becomes permanent, an array of firms within and outside these two countries will likely adjust in ways that imply significant economic costs. The once much vaunted and hyper-competitive international production chains that characterized the manufacturing muscle across Asian economies now face a political recalibration with attached economic costs and benefits. Clearly, such investment decisions can be a boon for some Asian countries, and we hope that is the case for the Philippines. And these include uh, Indonesia, of course, the Philippines, and Vietnam, in case they are able to take advantage of this realignment. In this context, the Philippines' economic partnership with tech giants like Japan and South Korea will be critical as it seeks to participate in the value chain realignment, attracting much needed investments while providing diversification and other advantages to these investors. So I was watching intently as uh, the good professor was moving around the Philippines in different parts of Southeast Asia. We have that uh, as a gift, I guess, as a country because we are really uh, strategically located. Some analysts, however, argue, and I will begin to close with these thoughts, that the weakening of this complex inter interdependence, which we have enjoyed and which has pushed the East Asian economic miracle and the growth period that we have experienced in the past two or three decades or even more, that this complex interdependence through a costly and deliberate process of decoupling can also result in a weaker security environment. Economic integration and interdependence embodied by deeply connected supply chains are thought to be incompatible with conflict. Hence, unwinding this relationship could also disturb the moderating effect of shared interests. Ultimately, these sweeping changes may not necessarily reverse globalization, but they can certainly slow it down. And that's the other part of this risk, as this might further fan some of the political flames that breed populism and protectionism, which was cited by the good professor. How nations will adapt to the changing economic, political, and technological and security environment this decade remains to be seen. However, clearly the search for efficiency and the need to moderate costs will span both the public and private sectors as governments, companies, and other economic stakeholders navigate a period of greater uncertainty and possibly slower growth. Thank you for the opportunity to share these thoughts today. Thank you very much, Ron. Our next speaker is Mr. Gregory Pauling, is, who is the Senior Fellow and Director of the Southeast Asia Program and Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative of the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. His research interests include the South China Sea disputes, US alliances and partnerships, democratization and governance in Southeast Asia, and maritime security across the Indo-Pacific. Greg joins us today via Zoom to talk about fostering a Philippines-US-Japan security cooperation. Thank you, Charmaine, and uh, magandang umaga, or for me, magandang gabi. Uh, 
I apologize in advance, but I'm not entirely lucid. Uh, it is getting a little late here, but first let me thank uh, ADRI and, and the embassies of Japan and the US and, and Dindo and Christina for uh, helping pull this together and inviting me. I think I'm gonna frame my remarks around a project that my team here at CSIS recently wrapped up on uh, coincidentally US Philippine Japan Alliance coordination. We hosted a, a workshop late last year in Tokyo in which we took uh, several American, several Philippine officials, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, former officials and, and experts, many of whom are, are in the room or on, uh, uh, I see in the, in the uh, list right now, uh, up to Japan to talk about shared security uh, threats and how the U.S. Philippine and, and Japan Philippine relationships can be better integrated to meet those threats. And then we published a report uh, based on those, those findings, those discussions last month. And the discussions really revolved around three things, which I think remain uh, critical to the shared threat perceptions, the shared interest of all three parties today. First is the issue of gray zone coercion to see. So um, I don't need to tell this audience the types of gray zone coercion that the Philippines regularly faces in the West Philippine Sea from China, uh, but Japan faces similar. Uh, types of gray zone threats in the East China Sea, in particular around the Senkaku Islands, and has long experience with confronting them, which I think could be useful uh, for sharing lessons learned with the Philippines. Second was the issue of military modernization for the armed forces of the Philippines. The United States remains the most important military partner of the Philippines. Last year, the United States uh, added an additional $100 million to the annual foreign military uh, financing that is provided to the AFP. And of course, we have other avenues for AFP modernization, including the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, which will see a lot of joint training opportunities and improvements to infrastructure. Uh, and at the same time, Japan has emerged as a major security partner for the Philippines over the last 10 years. It is not as large a provider of major platforms as the US or the Koreans for that matter, but it is uh, probably the third most important trading partner for the Philippines, for the AFP behind the US uh, and Australia. And that's probably going to increase as the uh, Philippines and Japan conclude, hopefully this year, a reciprocal access agreement, the equivalent of a status forces agreement, as well as an accident acquisition cross servicing agreement, which will allow more Japanese uh, platforms and, and support for the Philippines. And in the meantime, Japan has been extremely creative in finding ways to uh, use uh, concessionary loans and, and financing mechanisms to provide radar, patrol aircraft, uh, Coast Guard vessels, of course, to, to the Philippines. Last year, the Philippines was the first ever commercial buyer of a, a Japanese defense equipment uh, through the early airborne uh, warning radar that was purchased. The third bucket of issues we discussed and the most um, sensitive is the issue of Taiwan. Japan fully expects that it will have to play some role in any potential crisis over, over Taiwan, though what exactly that looks like will be highly dependent on the details of, of the crisis. And as we've heard um, just uh, recently, President Marcos, Secretary Manalo, um, multiple other Philippine officials say, in all likelihood, the Philippines will also be uh, implicated in one form or another in any fight over Taiwan, both because of the alliance with the United States, but also because of the geographic realities of northern Luzon being less than 200 miles from Taiwan and, and having nearly 200,000 overseas Filipino uh, citizens living in Taiwan who would be endangered in case of any Chinese military action. So we discussed how, the, how greater trilateral cooperation can help uh, on each of these three points. And uh, skipping ahead a bit uh, in the report, which if anybody's interested, I, I sincerely hope you download and read, let's talk, talk about the recommendations. We provided three main recommendations for the US and Japan in each of these buckets. Uh, first, on the question of countering gray zone coercion. Uh, one main recommendation we would make is greater degree of dialogue among all three parties uh, to coordinate our messaging on what exactly gray zone coercion is. What is this ill-defined thing we talk about um, when it comes to Chinese militia activity, Chinese Coast Guard activity, as well as Chinese influence operations, economic coercion, et cetera. Um, 
And in all likelihood, what, what we should be getting toward is baking some focus on counter and gray zone threats into the forthcoming U.S. Philippine uh, defense guidelines, which countering Chinese maritime coercion has already been a key focus of the U.S.-Japan alliance since at least 2015 U.S.-Japan defense guidelines. So logically, I think we should expect to see that focus carried forward into the new U.S. Philippine guidelines. Second, uh, we call for continued and really increasing support from both the U.S. and Japan on maritime domain awareness capabilities for the AFP and the Philippine Coast Guard. And this doesn't just mean manned platforms and manned vessels. I don't have to tell anybody here. I'm sure that most of the most capable ships of the Philippine Coast Guard right now are Japanese built. What we're really talking about is continuing support for remote sensing, um, satellite-based sensors, shore-based sensors. Japan has heavily funded coastal radar in the Philippines. The U.S., of course, helped fund the establishment of the National Coast Watch System. Uh, Japan and the U.S., along with Australia and India, are cooperating on the Quad's Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain Awareness Partnership, of which the Philippines was one of the three countries given the first batch of, of trial access to that data, which will help identify many, not all, but many um, dark vessels, particularly Chinese militia vessels in the South China Sea. Um, and one area that we really have not explored much, but I think we need to in the coming years is unmanned platforms. Uh, the US has considerable experience here. The, the best example that often gets pointed to is what's called Task Force 59, a US Navy program in uh, the Middle East operating out of Bahrain, which helps use unmanned sensors both in the air and at sea to track uh, shipping, illegal fishing, maritime crime in, in that part of the world. And there's been a lot of calls, including um, by some who took part in our workshop for the US 7th Fleet in Japan to set up a similar effort, Task Force 79, which would help provide the Philippines and other Southeast Asian partners with unmanned sensors that could help provide persistent uh, monitoring of the West Philippine Sea. Third recommendation on this front is that uh, the US and Japan and the Philippines can all work a lot more closely on identifying and publicizing Chinese coercion, gray zone activity in, in the West Philippine Sea. This was not possible during the last uh, presidency in, in uh, the Philippines, but is obviously now a major focus of the current Philippine government. Just this week, um, I, I saw uh, yet another statement from Philippine Coast Guard spokesperson Jay Tariella to, uh, to the point that the Philippine Coast Guard is now committed to publicize all Chinese uh, coercion in, in the South China Sea and is developing guidelines for doing that. The US and Japan can help here, um, both with the publicity, but also with the identification monitoring itself. Uh, and the US and Japan can also help share that with regional partners, especially the Vietnamese, but also the Malaysians and the Indonesians. In our second bucket of recommendations on US Japanese support for AFP modernization. Um, the most obvious, we need to accelerate capacity building for Philippine uh, facilities, not only at the EDCA sites, but more broadly at, at Philippine facilities. So it was useful um, to note that during President Marcos' state visit to, to Tokyo, which happened after we had already written this report, uh, part of the joint statement noted that Japan was going to take a particular look at supporting infrastructure at Subic. That's the kind of work that, that we need to see more of. It does not, again, have to be at the EDCA sites. It can be at any uh, facility. Um, and a lot of this should be focused on helping the AFP acquire the infrastructure and capabilities it will need to operate more advanced platforms that it hopes to acquire in the coming uh, years and decades. Second, speaking of those advanced platforms, the US and Japan should focus more of it, their capacity building assistance on helping the Philippines acquire and train on asymmetric strike capabilities. Um, this can mean unmanned platforms, lord of munitions, uh, but in, in particular, I think right now what, what a lot of folks have in mind are uh, shore-based missile systems, um, particularly the BrahMos uh, system that, that the Philippines hope to acquire by the end of this year from, uh, from India. Japan has invested heavily in its own ground-based anti-ship cruise missile systems in the Southwest Islands or Ryukyus, targeting waters around the Senkakus to make sure that it can hold Chinese vessels at risk from shore in order to enhance deterrence. The U.S. have established the new Marine Littoral Regiments with a similar mission. 
getting our Marine Littoral Regiments and Japanese counterparts training alongside the new Philippine Marine um, Combat Regiments would be, Littoral Regiments would be extremely helpful, I think, for, for capacity building on all sides. Uh, and finally, on this bucket, we need more of this dialogue and training to take place in trilateral and quadrilateral formats, quadrilateral being with the Australians. This doesn't all have to be formalized, but as Japan and the Philippines conclude a reciprocal access agreement and uh, an acquisition and cross-servicing agreement, it will be much easier for Japan to take part in larger numbers and in more robust ways in operations like Balikatan, uh, like um, uh, uh, Talisman Saber down in Australia, where they already have an RAA and now the Philippines is participating. I think it opens up a lot of possibilities both in the Philippines and more broadly across the region for this kind of trilateral and quadrilateral exercising um, and dialogue mechanics, for instance, through the MDB-SEP process where we could have observers from both Japan and Australia take part in at least some of these discussions. Uh, and our third and final bucket on, on Taiwan. Um, I'm happy to talk in, in Q&A about the you know, details on how I view um, likely Philippine responses or U.S. asks of the Philippines in the case of the Taiwan contingency. But what we have uh, in mind here are, are the, the kind of things we can do in advance um, of any such crisis. So one, um, and tying into to Ron's points, we need a lot more U.S. and Japanese support for Philippine economic development, um, trade, investment, ODA, all with, uh, I think, the strategic goal of enhancing Philippine economic resilience against potential Chinese retaliation, Chinese economic coercion. One very useful uh, tool in this toolkit will be Japan's new ODA guidelines. Japan has recently revised its, its overseas development assistance uh, guidelines so that it can provide uh, development assistance of strategic significance, um, you know, with with a mind to to bolstering the strategic capabilities and the resilience of partners, the Philippines should be a prime target of that. Uh, second, as part of starting with with the process of negotiating the U.S. Philippine Defense Guidelines, which hopefully we will see released during the upcoming two plus two summit between our Secretaries of State for Foreign Affairs and Defense, we should make sure that we have a clear shared understanding of mutual treaty obligations. What exactly do we think Articles 2, 4, and 5 of the U.S. Philippine Mutual Defense Treaty mean in armed contingencies outside of the Philippines and the West Philippine Sea? Uh, we don't want to have to have that discussion when a crisis has already erupted. And that won't be resolved clearly in the defense guidelines. It won't be that specific. Uh, but the defense guidelines should help start the conversation, which can then continue in perpetuity through uh, the BSD and, and, and other formats. Um, finally, uh, and this is just kind of a, a catch-all recommendation, the U.S. needs to recognize that its engagement with the Philippines will not be sustainable or resilient if it is only focused on security matters. We need to see far more and broader U.S. Philippine diplomatic and economic engagement. On the diplomatic side, the obvious uh, recommendation, which I think we make in just about every report at, at, at this point, is for the U.S. to open more diplomatic missions. Um, it's way past due for the U.S. to reopen the consulate in Cebu. We should be establishing other consulates, uh, Davao being the obvious example, where Japan has a consulate, as does China. The U.S. does not. We could also look to Locos Norte or other uh, provinces in the north. Um, on the economic front, uh, the U.S. would, I think, most productively engage by providing more support on clean energy transition. Um, we could look to something like the Just Energy Transition Partnership Agreements that have been negotiated recently with Indonesia and Vietnam to help the Philippines move away from coal and help deal with the, the pretty severe uh, energy shortage that's coming up as Malampaya runs dry. Second, critical minerals. Um, behind Indonesia, the Philippines has the world's second largest supply of nickel. Uh, the U.S. could clearly help the Philippines move up the value chain on things like battery production. Uh, third, trade liberalization, including the trade pillar bypass. But let's be realistic. The U.S. is not going to engage in multilateral trade liberalization discussions like we would want for the time being. So I would argue that the U.S. and the Philippines should at least begin preliminary discussions on an FTA. That's long been 
um, thought of as impossible on the U.S. side due to the highly restrictive nature of the foreign investment provisions of the Philippines 1987 Constitution. But as we saw with the revisions to the Public Services Act, the Philippines is open for business in a way that it hasn't been for decades and that I don't think the U.S. has fully appreciated yet. So those are our, our nine broad recommendations um, in that report. I hope that they provide just a starting point for the kinds of trilateral cooperation we can see between the U.S., Japan, and the Philippines. Uh, looking ahead, let me just end here. Uh, we're going to have a few exciting months. Sometime in the next month or two, we'll get a two plus two meeting um, between the U.S. and the Philippines. Hopefully that'll result in more details on the defense guidelines, as well as potentially joint patrols in the West Philippine Sea. Uh, hopefully we'll get a JASOMIA, a General Security of Military Information Agreement, by the end of the year. Um, and then I imagine we'll get a whole new set of to-dos as this alliance continues to deepen uh, and broaden in a way it hasn't since at least the 1970s. I'll wrap up there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, we seem to have three amazing presentations um, that that complement each other, um, despite the different um, areas of focus of the three presentations. They nonetheless, you know, converge on. Um, very specific points. So Professor Miyake, for instance, focused on the, histo on the, on the history. Uh, Dr. Ron Mendoza focused on the economic aspect. And Greg um, gave us uh, um, some, per some perspective on the, on the strategic aspect. And all of this actually point to the importance and the seeming inevitability of this trilateral cooperation between the Philippines, the United States, um, and Japan. So as we open the, uh, the, the Q&A, as um, I also ask members of the audience to raise their questions to our speakers, perhaps I can start the ball rolling um, and ask, how this trilateral cooperation may play out, either change, affect, impact, um, in regard to the West Philippine Sea. So, um, Professor Miyake, since you are our guest speaker, uh, maybe I can throw that first question at you, uh, specifically on the impact of this trilateral on the dynamics in the West Philippine Sea, South China Sea. Well, thank you. All right, you, you promised me that you're not going to ask difficult questions. That's the easiest <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, impact is extremely uh, important. Sir. It, it, it would be a president, president of the multilateral, multilateral sort of uh, cooperation in this part of the world. So I, I am uh, not in the government anymore, but I fully encourage you uh, three countries to work together because it's not only it's not the end it is the beginning of a series of uh, important uh, sort of uh, uh, multilateral co cooperative uh, 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 scheme to to follow. Is that okay? Perfect, uh, Dr. Mendoza. If you also have some insights on that, um, we have another question here. Yes, sir. Um, Jeremy Gatula from UANP Law. Um, this question is addressed to both Mr. Miyake and, and Ron. Um, there are reports coming out on a possible drastic demographic or population decline as far as China is concerned. Would you have any comments on that? And also with regard to any possible measures that the Philippines can take in response to it. Thank you. Okay, I think if we haven't started and time. Should be, okay. Um, China is in a, uh, in a difficult time. Um, population will start to shrink, and they are facing um, what, they, what they call, what I call the uh, middle income trap with the Chinese characteristics. So to make the long story short, um, they will stop growing, they will start declining. But having said that, even if they stop the uh, military expansion now, budget-wise, budget at least in the next 10 years, uh, uh, they will continue to be dominant. 
because the the all the investments, military investment is of course as you know, uh, it's in, they are in the pipeline. And the ten years ago, the investment ten years ago will 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 come out this this time. So that means even if they stop doing it now, we will have at least ten years of weapon systems and advanced technologies in the pipeline. And they're coming out. So they continue to be dominant. So we have to endure this coming decade so that nobody will attempt to change the status quo by force. And if we could do that, probably we'd be in a better shape to uh, work with the Chinese. For 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 a bit a bit of sort of economic and political environment in this part of the world. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Sorry. Just like to um, repeat the question is more with regard to the fact that you mentioned the Chinese have a 1.4 billion population. There are some estimates by 2040 it could be cut down to 650 million. So it, it's essentially that would that pose more danger for us, or is is it something that something that should be taken advantage of? Well, yes. Um, the question will probably uh, will should be focused on the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party. See, they liberated the United Land of China. Fine, they defeated uh, Japanese invaders in a patriotic war. It's fine. But the question is, what is their legitimacy now to rule as a one part in a one party system? To give what? So if, as you said, if the population starts shrinking and the economic level will go down, then will they continue to be happy with the, with the party? I do not know. So people will start asking or challenging the legitimacy of the Communist Party sooner or later. So we have to control that process. And no, I, I don't want to see any sort of a troubles or eruptions or divisions in that part of the world because that will make things much more difficult to solve. Thank you. I, I have a sort of a more benign interpretation of population growth moderation, which is probably a reflection of inclusive development and a growing middle class and a preference for smaller families and deeper investments, human capital investments across the board. So I am not a researcher of Chinese population growth, but uh, certainly for the Philippines, that is part of what we anticipate because we expect our youth bump, the, the largest number of young workers in the country is projected to be our hit around 2040. So we need to industrialize, mm -hmm. generate jobs, invest in human capital, improve education and health, fix our pensions, fix our healthcare, all of this before that happens because that's the time when we start growing old in a very, very fast uh, sort of short period. So I'm thinking if China is sort of like that and they lifted 800 to 900 million Chinese out of poverty and who are now in middle class, they will change behaviors. This is what happens to countries, right? And uh, some of it could be good for our environment, good for our global efforts to actually you know, become more sustainable. But obviously, some of it can also be political in, in its aspects. If you have a stronger middle class who are, is seeking greater agency in their governance, uh, there could be sort of other rep repercussions. Uh, this is a good, great point. But uh, the one thing I'd like to tell you is that based on our experience in Tokyo, in Japan, we started shrinking before, uh, after we got somehow rich. But China is different. They start shrinking before they get rich. So that's the difference between uh, Japan and China, and that will may have a negative impact on the legitimacy of the of the Communist Party. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question from the floor. Don't ask me. Yes. Hello, good morning. My name is Ana Sanchez from the EU delegation. I have a question for Miyake-san, and thank you very much for very interesting and visual presentation. You didn't mention in your presentation, although we saw the image of um, Chancellor Merkel 
in the picture the role of the European Union in these partnerships. Um, we also have an Indo-Pacific strategy that uh, I would say coincides on the same values of freedom and prosperity. We have a strategic partnership with Japan. Um, we are in increasing our cooperation with the Philippines and have always been very vocal in defending the rule of law uh, in the uh, South China Sea or West Philippine Sea. And also, what do you think of the role of ASEAN, or at least of key ASEAN members besides the Philippines? They also have a Indo-Pacific outlook, and they are all the, all, also in the map that you showed. Okay. Thank you so much. So uh, you're from uh, EU. EU. OK. Um, the la one thing I forgot or I didn't uh, mention is the importance of EU and NATO to our part of the world. And having lived in China, having lived in the Middle East, having lived in Baghdad twice, uh, nobody envy me. Um, conclude, let me conclude the following. See, in the past, uh, the theater in, e in Europe and the theater in the Middle East and the theater in, in the Pacific uh, had been, in a sense, been separate from each other, semi-independent from each other, but not anymore, not anymore. In order for Japan and the United States, and hopefully Philippines as well, and everybody, to maintain the status quo by deterring whatever uh, status quo changes, what we need, do you, what do you think is the most important thing for me, at least, to see? Number one, is not the strengthening of the US-Japan relation. Number one is a strong NATO, strong Europe, to deter the Russian. Second important thing is a stable Middle East, stable Gulf, to deter the Iranian. Then, finally, we can do something to this part of the world. Because if, what if? What if what if somebody in a huge nation wanted to take over Taiwan, for example? What would you do first? I will ask Iranian. I will call the uh, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei and say, hey, do something in the Gulf. That would um, keep the American naval forces busy. Fifth Fleet and part of Seventh Fleet will be busy in the Gulf. Or I would call Vladimir Putin again, say, do more something in the Middle East, uh, in, in Europe that keep Americans busy. So those three theaters of operations are intertwined, interrelated, it's well connected with each other. So that's why we have to be able to work together because the three theaters are becoming one theater of operation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we, we also still have some audience online. So if you, are, if you have any questions and you're in our Zoom, please send those questions via the Q&A function, the chat box in our Zoom, because we will still have a press briefing later with um, Professor Miyake, which will also be streamed. So if you still have questions online, please send them through our Zoom. Now, um, please join me again in thanking our speakers Professor Miyake, Dr. Ron Mendoza, and Greg Pauling for sharing their time, their insights um, for this morning. May I now please call on um, Professor Manhit, who will, who is the president of Stratbase ADR Institute, who will give us the closing remarks. Thank you, Shermaine. Thank you to our speaker, Professor Miyake. Thank you to our dear friend and partner, uh, Dean Ron. I still call him Dean Ron. And of course, old friend from Washington, D.C., Greg Poling. And to all of us here from civil society, the diplomatic community, media, uh, even some from the private sector. 
allow me to share our thoughts in our institute. This has been something that we have tried to advocate and stand for. The increasing geopolitical and economic importance of the Indo-Pacific is accompanied by an array of security risks that threaten the region's peace and stability. We have argued that in a multipolar and interconnected world, traditional, non-traditional, and even evolving security threats have become more complex, threatening to undermine the established rules-based order. In response to this security environment, various states have implemented strategies and policies that prioritize strategic partnerships with like-minded states. In the Institute, Strat-based Institute, we believe that achieving the shared vision of security and peace is a collective responsibility of the international community. Maintaining a rules-based order through this strategic partnership is critical to realizing a free, and open Indo-Pacific. Any attempt to undermine regional peace and stability cannot compete with the commitment of states to uphold international law. Such an order must be respected and defended at all costs. The Philippines, for its part, is dealing with a number of persistent issues that threaten its national security. While this call for better policy implementation, cooperation with like-minded states, remains a strategic initiative. Japan and the United States continue to be two of the Filipinos' most trusted countries. And I refer geographically, demographically, across the Philippines. As President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. promised to protect Philippine interests, it is only fitting that his administration maintains a more meaningful relationship with the country's allies. The strategic partnership with the, between the Philippines and Japan according to President Marcos Jr., is stronger than ever. Furthermore, the strong partnership of the Philippines and the United States, according to our President, leads to a shared future. Both countries have consistently offered their assistance to the Philippines, particularly in defense and security initiatives. More importantly, Japan and the United States have consistently supported the Philippines in its 2016 arbitral victory in the West Philippine Sea. This emphatically reiterated whenever there are emerging issues in the West Philippine Sea, such as a recent incident of Chinese, China's pointing a military-grade laser against the Philippine Coast Guard. In this context, the international community's consistent recognition and support are critical in asserting our country's sovereign rights on its territory and defending the rules-based international order. To effectively respond to security challenges in the maritime domain, working with friends and allies through joint maritime patrol will enforce our national sovereignty and territorial integrity. Filipinos support this. With 80% believing that the Philippine Navy, the Philippine Coast Guard should be prioritized and strengthened, this further validates the strategic importance of alliances and partnership in safeguarding the West Philippine Sea. Aside from these efforts, the current administration's recent engagement with Japan and the United States include a potential trilateral defense mechanism and a visiting forces agreement with Japan. Although no final agreement have been reached, the institute, our institute, sees this as opportunities to promote rules-based order through cooperation among like-minded states. The Philippines must strengthen alliances and partnership with states that have avowed to protect rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific, that which is now being disrupted by, impact, by expansionist ambitions and militarizations. The Institute, Strat-based Institute, supports bilateral, multilateral, and even minilateral initiatives aimed at promoting peace and stability in the region. We've been doing this for the past 10 years. When we, when we introduce our program on defense and security. With the national interest as prime requisite, the pres President Marcos Jr. administration must continue to implement an independent, a truly independent external policy that is responsive, strategic, and Filipino-centric. 
as a leader of our nation during these trying, complex, and precarious times, the people will expect an unwavering performance of its duty to uphold the territorial and sovereign rights of our country. And with the Filipino people, we share this expectation and we share this hope. Thank you for everyone for joining us, supporting us, and being here with us this morning. Before we, thank you so much, um, Sir Dindo, for your closing remarks. But before we close today's program, Stratbase ADR Institute would like to take this opportunity to invite everyone to the next discussion entitled Countering Gray Zone Operations in the Maritime Indo Pacific. This is going to be, this hybrid event is going to take place on March 8th. 2023, that's a Thursday from 9 a.m. to 12 noon at the Ballroom 2 of the New World Hotel in Makati. Thank you once again. And lastly, we invite our friends from the media for a press briefing with Professor Miyake Kunihiko. And again, this will um, still be streamed via Zoom. Thank you so much, everybody. Sorry, thank you for that. March 8th is a Wednesday for the next discussion. Thank you. 
people were on this side. And our budget for defense has been, fortunately, pretty low, pretty small. But given the drastic change in the security environment in our part of the world, in your part of the world, maybe a successful 12% of the GDP will not be enough. So when people started, people in my country started beginning to understand the reality. So, so it shouldn't be a maybe specific percentage, but that will be more ammunition, more uh, capability to, to fight longer so that um, the uh, potential adversaries may think twice before trying something. Are the Japanese people ready to abandon the Pacific? Uh... We continue to be a pacifist nation. Of course, of course. We are pacifists, but in the past, fortunately, because of the um, very unfortunate, very fortunate security environment, we didn't have to spend more. But now, in order to continue to be a pacifist nation, we must spend more because we want to encourage the other side not to do it. Okay. Regarding the joint patrol uh, with the U.S. and the Japan and South China Sea, there are fears that if this is done, it might lead to further aggression from China. It might infuriate China. What do you think of this? Um, it is a difficult uh, uh, question because if we just appease the other side, they may misunderstand mm -hmm. our intention. Our intention is not uh, to appease and let them do what they want to do. Our intention is encourage them not to do that. So uh, we need to show our capability to do this while we continue to uh, talk to them. Uh, in the dialogue uh, with uh, with uh, like minded countries, because we don't what what the most important thing we have to avoid is miscalculation. So in order to do that, um, we show force while we talk to them. Okay. Yes. Oh. I'm just curious on that bilateral cooperation. Mm -hmm. What form do you think? this security impact will, will take? Uh, whatever form. Yes. Whatever form available and politically correct. You see, because it's, it's evolving, it's, it's, it's changing. And of course, we need uh, support from people. See? So therefore, it, the process will be very incremental and it should be politically correct and uh, uh, without uh, sending a wrong, a wrong signal to the other side. So it may take time, but the, the most important thing is that we have that intention and we started doing it and it will continue so that the other side will not misunderstood. Uh, within the context of the Japanese constitution, as far as Japan is concerned, we do not do uh, beyond the constitution, of course not. But the um, uh, it is sometimes relative to the changing in uh, security environment in our part of the world and your part of the world. So it's everything is relative to a certain extent, but we will not uh, go beyond our constitution. Thank you very much, okay. sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.